remember though, Felder v. Casey and Martinez versus uh, County of Los Angeles, any state law that's going to impair your federal civil plaintiff's ability to get full compensation for the violation of their civil rights is preempted. So like MICRA, I'll, I don't know what you guys have out here. There's MICRA limits. There's, I think, Civil Code Section 51 in California. I think it's 51 that limits uh, you know, damages in certain cases, just compensatory. None of that stuff applies here, which is another reason I love 1983, is you get to go for the whole ball of wax. It would have limited if you've got a state cause of action that's concurrently being tried in court. Well, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, about the reasons why sometimes, you know, especially more recently, like over the last five years, we've started less and less alleging state claims because you have all these restrictions. You got these caps, you have these immunities. It doesn't really gain you anything. You're going to work a lot really hard to get where? 1983, I don't care about your immunities. I don't care about your caps. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just care about what the, the Ninth Circuit's telling me I get. And they're telling me I get everything, plus my attorney's fees. So, you know, I know under certain circumstances where it's clean and juicy, I'll still plead a state law claim. But generally speaking, it, it, you know, it's not, in my view, I mean, there's other guys, you know, I said, there's, I told you guys earlier, there's like 10 guys in California that do this work. I know for a fact, at least two of those offices, they plead everything that can possibly be pled. And that's their approach, and it works for them, that's great. But I don't, I don't want to spend the time on something that's not going to get me further, closer to the target that we're really aiming for. Um, we got that, many different flavors. Let's get into them. Okay, a lot of different ways you can prove up Monell liability. County policy practice or procedures, the moving force behind the violation when the actions and conduct of the individual government officials were executed pursuant to and or in accordance with the county's policies, customs, procedure, culture, which is interesting, practices and or usages. Yeah, that's one flavor. Plaintiff does not need to show that the county expressly or formally adopted a policy that is sufficient if the constitutional violation occurred pursuant to a long-standing practice or custom. Long-standing practices and customs you're going to get from the line workers and their supervisors. The people higher up, they aren't necessarily going to know what the practice is at the line level. At least what the current practice is at the line level. If they work their way up through the system, they may have an understanding of what the customs and practices were at the time they were there, but that's not necessarily going to be relevant on the Monell claim to the customs and practices that were in place at the time of your plaintiff's event. So you're going to have to work with your line level workers and supervisors or nurses and doctors. County may be liable for an established custom regardless of whether official policy makers had actual knowledge of the practice at issue. So if the board of supervisors, for example, are in charge of promulgating policy, but they don't, they don't know what's going on down there, that's not a defense. It's not a defense that they actually don't know. Okay, how do you prove up? Monell claim, a pattern of inadequate training, instruction, or supervision. That's the city of Canton v. Harris. Actual knowledge on the part of official policy makers and a failure to correct, address, or discipline. Remember we were talking earlier today about indemnification for punitive damages awards, right? Actual knowledge. In order to get indemnification, the county board of supervisor has to, supervisors has to vote and approve the indemnification for punitive damages. So they definitely have actual knowledge. What did they do after that approval to rectify the situation so it never happens again? Well, absolutely nothing. There you go, a mail claim. Unconstitutional conduct by a municipal agent which is ratified by an official policymaker through approval of the subordinate's decision uh, and the basis for that decision. Same basic facts, same basic circumstance. A little bit different twist. And I always recommend, actually, to the juvenile dependency practitioners that if you see something going south in a case and say the social worker is lying to the judge consistently, or even once, really, make sure that you write, you know, document in writing in complaint form and send it out to each city council member, each board of supervisors member, the director, the supervisor, anybody and every, the ombudsman, whoever, anybody and everybody you can think of in the chain of command 
who would have the ability to go investigate your claim and if they think it's true to rectify the situation. Because when you get in front of the jury on that, you're going to have those letters. And you're going to put it in evidence. Well, I, I sent this to the mayor. Mayor, did you get it? Well, yeah, I got it. I didn't do anything with it. Sent it to the city council. Well, yeah, I got it. We didn't do anything with it. Right? Well, they're on notice. What did they do? Absolutely nothing. If the jury ends up believing that your rights were violated, they're going to hit them for Monell because the policymakers were informed. They had an opportunity to investigate and rectify. They didn't do jack. And they never will. I mean, you're never going to get a response to one of those letters because these people, they just don't, don't think they can do anything wrong. You know? So you don't have to worry about you know, them doing something and that you know, impairing in some way your Monell claim later because they're just not going to do it. It's, it's not an issue. This is one thing that we've used before also, sufficient, sufficiently notorious misconduct so that official policy makers know or should know of the risk to people's federal rights. There's a lot of different ways you can get sufficient, uh, sufficiently notorious conduct. Um, what we do, I told you this earlier, as part of the effort to you know, push the public policy change ball down the road, is we encourage and respond to media inquiries all the time about our cases all the time. There, there's no better way to impact your veneer or impact policymakers or impact your case than to get the issue you're litigating in the public eye with enough force that you can get in front of the jury and successfully argue that, hey, this is all over the place. Everybody knows about it. It's notorious misconduct. What have you done to address it? Nothing. Right? So you want the media coverage, you'll want all of that, and you can weave this in, this concept, into your depositions, particularly with your 30B6 opponents, or uh, persons most knowledgeable, most qualified. And the way that I do it is, uh, you've been there 20 years, yeah. Now, um, and they're typically in some you know, high-level supervisory position. You want to lay the foundation that they've been through the mill. They started as a worker, they you know, moved up to supervisor, and then ultimately they're in some position of command. And in that time, that 22 years, uh, you've heard a lot of parent complaints. So, yeah, I've, I've heard some. And some of those complaints included complaints about um, social workers not being totally honest with the court and their reporting. Yeah, I've, I've heard those complaints. Well, in fact, you've seen that, uh, at least allegations of that kind of conduct in... Uh, the media, newspaper, television news. Well, I don't, I don't really, well, maybe I, I remember something like that vaguely. All right. Well, on, on what, you know, percentage? I mean, how frequently would you think that happens? Oh, not frequently at all. Maybe maximum two or three times a year. So what do you do to investigate that? Oh, we look into it. Do it by doing what? They don't typically have anything to say about that. And do you do anything to address it when, when you do find it? Say, oh, well, everyone that I know of that's been investigated, we found it uh, to be unfounded, unfounded allegation. Say, oh, every single one in your entire 20 years with the agency. These complaints were by parents that social workers were lying in their reports, were unfound. You found them. You guys, yourself, investigated and found them to be untrue. Yeah. And that's why you haven't promulgated any policies or any training to address that issue is because through your own investigation you found these complaints to be untrue. Yeah, that's right. All right. You know, I'm cool with that. They're, 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 they're in there investigating their own stuff. You've had all these articles and stuff in the media. People do not feel the same way about social workers as they feel about cops. Cops are the heroes of 9-11, man. They can get, literally get away with murder. But I didn't see any social workers running into those buildings. Right? And the general public, they understand that. They, they view social workers in a different light. So what you then are going to be arguing to the jury, you, you prove to them the lie. Dr. Gill, right, comes in and says, nah, I never talked to that lady. And we know that the client complained about it because we have the letter to the Board of Supervisors. So everybody's on notice. But we never find any of these complaints to be true. So of course we don't do anything to address it. Well, there you go. The jury will buy that. And it's true, they should buy it. Okay, where the person causing the violation has final policy-making authority, 
or the final policymaker acted with deliberate indifference to a subordinate's constitutional right. Uh, this Christie v. Iopa, the same sort of concept is addressed. Let's see if we have it here. I don't see it. It was er an earlier so uh, slide in Chu versus Gates. And um, where that comes into play, it's sort of interesting because obviously, um, if the supervisor is the one making the call, the one in charge, then she's likely to be the final policy making um, decision maker with respect to the, the subordinate's particular conduct, assuming that there is nobody above her that, or policies, practices, things like that in place to direct her conduct. What happens though with the line worker, and you see this most often in the municipal litigation or private party litigation <coughs> against um, you know, the seizing worker where there was no warrant policy in place or there was a warrant policy in place but there was no training in place on that policy yet because the policy was too new and that happens. I think you guys might have that situation here in Arizona. Um, but it's not a municipality so it doesn't matter. But what happens is if there's no training in place to educate the line worker about their responsibilities and, and the um, limitations that circumscribe their conduct, then that line level worker for purposes of determining Monell liability is treated as the final policy decision maker. So if there's not a structure in place to control that person's conduct and they're out in the field and ah, I'm going to grab that kid, they are the final decision maker. They are the final policy maker for Mon Monell purposes. I think that's going to come into play more in like if you're doing police litigation because that's going to be against a city or a county. It's not going to impact your state uh, analysis in any way. <coughs> Another one uh, is a gap in policy or training in the face of a known need for policy and training. That'll satisfy Monell requirements as well and that gets again to the situation where we know we need to get warrants. We may even have training on warrants. But at the time of the seizure, we didn't have the forms available. We didn't have the procedures in place. We didn't really have a policy. We, we were training our social workers. They got to do it. But we didn't have the mechanism there in place for them to do what they're supposed to do. That's an unconstitutional gap in policy. And we know we need it because we've been sued umpteen times for the same thing. So. Gap in policy in the face of a known need. Uh, many flavors still. Regardless of whether the county has formal policies, the routine failure to follow a general policy by county social workers can itself constitute, constitute an unconstitutional custom practice or usage. So that, that basically goes to the issue. The counties or uh, cities, law enforcement, they're always going to come up and say, well, we've got all these great policies in place to address exactly the issue you're concerned about. So, okay, what do you do to make sure that everybody's actually following those policies? Where are your disciplinary records? Where's your training? What, what do you do? What mechanism do you have in place to enforce those policies to ensure that they're actually put into practice? Oh, well, we have an expectation that the officers will do that. Well, that's really cool because in the Ninth Circuit, an expectation doesn't meet your burden. That's a Monell violation. You can have the best policy in the world. If you don't do anything to train on it or enforce it, it doesn't matter. Policy or custom may be inferred if after constitutional violations occurred, government officials took no steps to reprimand, discipline, or discharge the offending social workers, or if they otherwise failed to admit the social worker's conduct was in error. Again, that gets to training, discipline, enforcement mechanisms. If they don't have an enforcement mechanism, Again, best policy in the world doesn't matter. County's failure to properly investigate constitutional violations is evidence of and supports of finding the violations were not only accepted but were customary. Remember we were talking about putting the county on notice and once they're on notice maybe they should investigate, maybe they should do something. If they don't, that's more evidence. Constitutional violation resulting from a gap in, county in the county's express policy is sufficient to establish, we talked about that. The extent and openness of social workers' constitutional violations, and again, these are police cases we're citing, but the same concepts apply. The extent and openness of social workers' constitutional violations supports an inference that managerial level employees should have known of the need to remedy a potentially unlawful practice. So again, 
if we have social workers seizing kids left and right, no warrants, lying about them, everybody knows it's happening, it's very notorious, it's all over the place, and the upper level management aren't doing anything about it, it's Monell. Or at least evidence of Monell. Okay, ways to prove a Monell claim, request for admissions, these are great. County's admission that the individual defendant's conduct conformed to its policies, customs, or practices is sufficient by itself to establish municipal law. You see, I'm like almost laughing. I can't contain myself. This is so cool. Okay, that's the law. By itself, their admission, it's enough. So what you do in these cases, start with the pleadings. You're looking for judicial admissions, right? You say, at all relevant times, social workers X, Y, and Z were comporting with the regularly established customs policy practices of the county of whatever, or the city of whatever, or PCH. They're almost always going to admit that because they don't see it coming. They don't know the law. They didn't sit here for hours and hours going through this class. <laughs> they have no clue, <laughs> all right? But this is very clearly well-established law. If they admit it, you're done, right? So you start in the complaint put that allegation. Immediately, as soon as discovery opens, along with your course and scope of your duties, you serve the RFA saying, admit that in their conduct in the underlying juvenile dependency case number, whatever it is, they were at all times comporting with the established, regularly established customs policies, practices of whatever entity. They'll typically admit that. You might get some objections, but ultimately an admission. You can fight over that or not. As long as you have an admission, that's good enough. Um, then what you do, is you hold that in your pocket for years and you get in front of your jury, you prove up the unwarranted seizure, you prove up the lie, and then the judge asks you if you're done. And you start to like walk towards your chair and you're thinking about saying, yeah, I'm done. And you say, oh, yeah, you, you know, Your Honor, there's one more thing. We have these requests for admissions we'd like to read to the jury. And now the jury's heard all the evidence and they're thanking God that you're done. You know, it's been like walking through molasses. And uh, you get up there and you say, uh, and the judge will instruct them what a request for admission is, and that it's binding, it resolves the issue, resolves the dispute, and then you read it to them. And you say, uh, request for admission number one. Admit that, say, County of Los Angeles is regularly established customs and policies, practices, or, I'm sorry, I blew that. Admit that that social worker Susan Pender Kimberly Rogers, Muzian Balaban, at all times were acting in accordance with the regularly established customs policies and practices of the County of Los Angeles. Answer, admit. Sit down, shut up, you're done, you rest. That's it. They get up in their case, they do whatever they're gonna do, jury gets instructed, they get their verdict form, they get back in the room within, I don't know, maybe a couple hours. A question every single time in every one of these things where we do this, a question will come out from the jury. And you know, the judge has to share that with you. Everybody gets to talk about it. And invariably the question is, we would like a copy of the admission. <laughs> every single time. If they got to that point, I know we got them. All right, as soon as that question comes, I'm like, all right, we're through liability. <laughs> you know, because they don't get to Monell liability unless they've already found the individual liability, right? So the minute they're asking for a reread of the request for admission, where the county admitted that at all times these social workers were doing what they were supposed to do according to our policies, and they lied, they cheated, they stole, they did all these horrible things, the case is done. All we're talking about is damages, and then typically it'll take days for the juries to sort out what this is worth. Because it's a tough question. I mean, what is that worth? It's an innately human question. And it's not something that the law gives us a lot of guidance on. What is, you know, a year with your child or a year not with your child? What is a day not with your child? What is that worth? How do you put a value on that? The cool thing is that it is in our system. We recognize that it is an innately human question. And it's not answered by the law. It's not answered by a judge. It's answered by members of our community, us. What do we value that? What value do we place on it? We are the marketplace. And so the jury has a lot of latitude and they'll exercise it. You know, if you laid it up right, they'll exercise it. But anyway, that's, that's how you prove up your Monell, or how we prove up the Monell claim. I haven't blown it on this one yet. This is actually a, a very effective approach. 
And that it's funny because, you know, the, the transcripts are all publicly available. The, the, the other county council, the government attorneys, if they want to spend the time, do the work, they can figure out the game plan. They know my playbook. I'm, I don't hide it. it. It's there. But for whatever reason, they don't. And, you know, we just... Uh, Monell claims based on in inadequate training. Inadequate training of county social workers serves as a basis for liability against the county where the failure to train amounts to deliberate indifference to the constitutional rights of the persons with whom the subordinate social workers come into contact and the constitutional injury would have been avoided had the county properly trained its workers. As basic issue, you gotta train your people about how to avoid violating people's rights. Simple direct. And that's another thing is it goes back to discipline. There may be a slide in here, maybe not. But like policies, training, even the best training in the world, if you don't enforce it through discipline, it doesn't matter because the customs and practices in the field are not going to conform with the training unless you enforce it. What's deliberate indifference in this context? It means the conscious choice to disregard the consequences of one's acts or omissions. Good source of information for that is, again, the Ninth Circuit Civil Jury Instructions. Okay, how to prove deliberate indifference. A county that is aware or should be aware of recurring constitutional violations but fails to adopt a policy or implement rules to prevent those constitutional violations is deliberately indifferent to constitutional rights. Under such circumstances, it can be inferred that plaintiff's injury was caused by the county's failure to engage in oversight of important departmental practice. So how do you prove that? How do you prove that the county is aware or should be aware that its social workers continuously go out and seize kids without warrants where they shouldn't be doing that? Well, it's a good question. And I can tell you the way that we did it is you have two choices. You have your, your witnesses who themselves sued the county for taking their kids without a warrant. They filed complaints, litigated them, maybe got settlements, maybe tried them. So the county definitely knows they got sued, right? They get notice of that. Then you have the attorneys that prosecuted those cases and they know because they prosecuted those cases. So you're permitted in order to prove up that notice component you are permitted to bring those people in at trial, at least I was permitted to bring those people <laughs> in at, at trial and have them testify. Now what happened in that particular case is the county brought a motion in limine. We were going to bring in like 30 plaintiffs, prior plaintiffs, and two attorneys that litigated all these cases. And the county did a motion in limine to preclude us from bringing in those prior plaintiffs who, by the way, settled their cases in the aggregate for tens of millions of dollars. And uh, so they did a motion in limine and the judge granted it. <coughs> then they had another motion in limine because we also identified the attorneys that prosecuted those cases. And the judge looks at that and he says, well, um, you know, they have to prove up notice. How would they prove up notice? How would they do that? I mean, because the, the, the county wanted us to just rely on them, on their witnesses. And the judge says, well, no, they don't have to rely on your people who are gonna come in here and maybe not tell the whole story. Uh, I think they can bring in their own people. Now, I'll give you a choice. They can bring in the individual plaintiffs, and we'll listen to 30 of those, or we can bring in the attorneys, and they'll just give us a summation. And, and we had, like, a uh, conference, and they went out and did their thing, and they come back, and they selected the attorneys, the idea being that the attorneys will be seen by the jury to be advocates, they won't have any credibility, and we can undermine everything that they're going to get up there and say. So we put on the attorneys, they talk about giving the notice to the county of its um, defective training policies, practices, by suing them over the last you know, six, eight years, repeatedly for the same stuff, even some of the same social workers. And in every deposition asking them, has anybody ever been disciplined? Have you ever heard of anybody being disciplined? Have you done anything to address this? Everybody's no, 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 here's a check, leave me alone. So that's the evidence the jury hears. Now the county can't deny notice, right? And we've already heard from the attorney that in every deposition they do of a county PMK or 30B6 type deposition, they ask the person most knowledgeable, who's been disciplined, what do you do to rectify it, what training did you put in place to correct it, what policies did you put in place to correct it, the answer's all none. And that's the same every single time. Now the jury has that evidence. 
And that satisfies a county that is aware or should be aware, because they now should be aware at a minimum, of recurring constitutional <laughs> violations and fails to address it is going to be liable. We ended up on that case, we had a 12-0 verdict, unanimous verdict on Monell. Mm -hmm. And we had it in more than one flavor. We had it in um, gap in policy. We had it in failure to train. Deliberate indifference may be proved by showing the county knew its failure to train adequately made it highly predictable that its social workers would engage in conduct that would deprive persons such as the plaintiff of her constitutional rights. She's not required to prove responsible county officials had subjective awareness. It's all new or should have known. Can be established through evidence showing a series or pattern of, unconst or of constitutional violations. That's the attorneys getting up there talking about how I sue these guys all the time. And in fact, one of them testified. In fact, Mr. Gutierrez, that was the defense attorney, cross-examining him, said, well, in fact, Mr. Gutierrez, you and I, we, we have one of these cases going right now. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. <laughs> so, yeah, that's always great, and I think you have a good argument to get either the plaintiffs or the attorneys, and maybe both if you're lucky, into court in front of your jury. Um, and, yeah, here's the comment. I've used other lawsuits and settlements that show pattern and notice. This uh, addresses the private entity question earlier. 42 U.S.C. Section 1983 applies to private actors. To act under color of state law for Section 1983 purposes does not require that the defendant be an officer of the state. Private parties, including like hospitals and doctors, act under color of state law where there is significant state involvement in the action. While there's no specific formula for defining, or, yeah, for defining whether state action exists, Courts have traditionally evaluated whether a private actor is engaged in state action by relying on four distinct but not mutually exclusive tests. It's the government nexus test, the joint action test, the public function test, and the state compulsion test. Typically what we see in the situations where we're talking about hospitals is they're under contract with the government to provide traditional government services that's going to fall under either the governmental nexus test or the joint action test. Could also fall under the public func function test because they're <coughs> providing traditional government services like investigation services, things like that, which are things cops or detectives or social workers normally do. A private hospital acts under color of state law when it expressly contracts with the government to provide medical services. Bang. There's PCH. Welcome to the party. All right. Likewise, contract services provided by licensed private physicians to municipal governments, and, and this is going to be to state governments as well, in the examination of persons brought into treatment facilities by government officials constitute state action within the meaning of section 1983. So I don't know who the big uh, child abuse pediatric specialists are out here. We have a bunch of them back there. It's our practice to sue every damn one of those guys when they come in and start making claims that they can't support under 1983 because the Ninth Circuit tells us we can. Likewise, contract services licensed uh, physicians. So they're, they're targets. Yeah. I just wanted to confirm that that includes like behavioral health, like yeah, that anybody, with DCS and stuff? It, it, anybody that's providing traditional government services under contract with the government is a target, and I like them better as targets because you know they have private insurance, and you're going to get, uh, in my view, a little bit higher. Um, I don't want to say anything. You're, you're just going to get better representation on the other side. You're going to get somebody you can work with. You're going to get somebody that, that has their own motivations, financial motivations, to resolve the case instead of throw up every single roadblock they can possibly think of. Unless you've got an unethical crew that's just in there, you know, churning their bill. Then they've got, they've got a cash cow if they have a government client. They're just going to sit there and bill the hell out of it and do everything. I've had those guys. Those ones end up in trial. Um, but the vast majority of the insurance defense bar, they're good guys. You know, they, they see it, they're looking out for the best interest of their client, they'll immediately do the analysis and say, oh yeah, we have problems here, let's value it and get rid of it. No immunity for government or private agencies performing traditional government functions. 
Monell applies to suits against private entities. So remember, we talked about that a little bit earlier. If we're going after PCH, for example, they're a private entity, but they're performing a traditional government function, investigatory services under contract, it applies. And we apply all the Monell standards that we talked about earlier that we would normally raise against county or city governments to these private entities. All the same theories. No immunity from municipalities or private entities targeted by Monell claims. If you meet the elements, you got it. Qualified immunity, this is just gonna apply to the individual um, defendants who are human beings. Two questions that you have to address when the court's ruling on qualified immunity. First question is whether the right violated was clearly established at the time of violation and whether the evidence shows the government official's conduct violated that constitutional right. Remember earlier when I was talking about in order to shift the law in respect to, in respect to qualified immunity, you've got to be willing to lose some cases on appeal. That's what we're talking about. To get the appellate court to acknowledge that a right is clearly established, you've got to go up there and, and do it. And the first time that they agree with you, that worker, that defendant is going to get off. And the reason they're going to get off is because at the time of the misconduct, that right was not clearly established. Now it is. Going forward, everybody knows that is a clearly established right. But this guy that did it in this case, he's going to get off. He's going to get off on qualified immunity. So you got to, you know, if you're going to shift the law, you got to be willing to take some hits. Um, and then obviously, if, if your evidence ends up showing, yeah, this person lied, then that's the second element or yeah, this person took my kid without a warrant and no exigency, that's your element. And it's the defendant's burden, at least in the Ninth Circuit. Other circuits, uh, I think, are different. They're not all the same. In the Ninth Circuit, it's the defendant's burden to plead and prove qualified immunity. If they fail to plead it, they're out. And if they can't prove it, they're out. The proof is a legal question, typically, so it's something that's gonna get decided by the judge, not necessarily by the jury. Um, yeah, it's the plaintiff's burden to prove up the second component, and that's that the um, right that was alleges, allegedly established, um, you know, was clear at, it was a clearly established right at the time the incident happened. And again, that's going to be a legal question. You're going to do that through your research. You find a case that addresses circumstances similar to yours where the appellate court said, yes, there's this clearly established right the cop or worker, whoever, couldn't do this. And it's, it's all a research issue. A lot of this stuff you, you can find. Um, yeah, obviously the facts on a qualified immunity attack are viewed in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. Whether or not a, a federal right was clearly established at a particular time is a pure question of law. The jury doesn't get it. Plaintiffs need not establish that specific liability generating behavior has been previously declared unconstitutional. Officials can still be on notice that con conduct violates established law even in novel factual circumstances. The key is, is that it's got to be close enough. If it's close enough that the appellate court thinks that the case should have put everybody on notice, then that's good enough. <clears throat> Absolute immunity, that's the next one, and this is pretty much Absolute immunity, at least in my view, is pretty much a dead issue in the Ninth Circuit. We've been through the Hardwick case, we've been through Beltran, we've talked about Rogers, we've talked about Tomas, and over, over the years, be, beginning with Wallace, back in, what was that, 1999, the Ninth Circuit has steadily marched towards this idea that when they seize kids without a warrant and lie about it, there just can't be any immunity. So that we get to today, the government still raises the defense. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're still going to put it out there. But I no longer see it as a significant threat. All right? There's plenty of case law out there to address whatever arguments they're going to raise, and it's just not going to work. Um, with respect to absolute immunity, and that's qualified immunity and absolute immunity, but with respect to absolute immunity, it's, again, got to be pleaded and proved by the party asserting it, at least in the Ninth Circuit. And they're distinct defenses. Pleading, the pleading of absolute immunity is insufficient to preserve a qualified immunity claim and vice versa. What I've, I have encountered before is where in their answer, the county failed to plead the absolute immunity. All they pled was qualified immunity and we were able to blow that out in the jury verdict. 
But then the, the county wants to come back and they want to say, well, wait a minute, we have this absolute immunity defense. We forgot to plead it. Um, let us assert it now because it's a pure question of law. No, it's waiver. They waived it. The time to plead it is before it gets in front of a jury. Once we're up there, you didn't plead it, you waived it, you're done. And that was affirmed on appeal. So, you know, they have to plead and prove it. And uh, the Ninth Circuit has severely restricted the use of absolute immunity as applied to social workers for that. Look at Beltran, look at Tomas, look at Rogers. Ninth Circuit's really tightening the noose on these guys. Absolute immunity for testimony. That's testimony immunal, uh, testimonial immunity. Somebody had a question about this at one of the breaks. I don't remember who, but it was, uh, might have been Joe, maybe not. But there was an issue about a witness on the stand lying. And, you know, Briscoe v. LaHue is the lead case that the government always raises. And yeah, the Supreme Court has said, at least in the circumstances of that case, that the testifying party who's on the stand, this doesn't apply to documents and stuff like that, the testifying party on the stand gets absolute witness immunity. We want to encourage people to testify and tell their truth, tell their story, so we give them immunity for whatever they're going to say. Testimonial immunity, though, does not encompass non-testimonial acts, such as fabricating evidence. So if they're making stuff up, it's fabricating evidence. You know, witness immunity, it's a dicey question for them. Um, and again, another San Diego case, Marsh versus County of San Diego. It's a district court case, but it's thoroughly cited. You know, the Ninth Circuit decisions are replete with citations to Marsh, so I feel pretty comfortable that that's going to be, you know, good authority to rely on. Uh, when defendants have dual roles, however, as witness and fabricator, extending protection from the testimony to the fabricated evidence would transform the immunity from a shield to ensure candor into a sword allowing them to trample the statutory and constitutional rights of others. It's Lisker versus a, a city of Los Angeles. That's a cop case, police case. But remember, we apply the same principles with social workers because they're performing very similar functions to what police do in their investigations and testifying in court. So now, in the Ninth Circuit, this is a fairly recent case, there's good reason to take those cases where you know, your, your fabrication or your perjured testimony even came on the witness stand. Under Lisker, you have a shot at getting it through. I'm, I'm not sure how good of a shot yet. Very good language in there. I have no reason to believe that the Ninth Circuit's not gonna adhere to that, and it's binding in the Ninth Circuit because it is a published <coughs> opinion, so the trial court should adhere to it too. It's a chipping away of, it doesn't eliminate Briscoe v. LaHue, but it's a chipping away of that immunity, which is how all these things work. You know, you chip away here, you chip away there, you chip away somewhere else, and eventually you get this nice, clean body of law. Unlike most private tort litigants, this is attorney's fees. This is probably one of the most critical issues that you'll address in this type of litigation in your practice. If you're not making money, I, I know there's a lot of people out there on social media, a lot of parents that are berating the attorneys that won't take their cases or, you know, whatever, or money-grubbing, greedy. They have all kinds of names for us. This is the deal, is if you can't survive, and it takes money to survive, to pay your mortgage, pay your car payment, take care of your own kids, feed your family, clothe your family, if you can't do that, you're not going to help anybody. So all these people out there scrambling and looking for somebody to help them, they got to understand that if we can't make a living, we can't do your work. So it's critical that we get paid for the effort. And I mean, I don't want to be a jerk about it, but you know, people just got to understand it's already enough of a thankless job. We don't need our clients or, or prospective clients coming in and beating us up because, you know, they think it's all about the money. It's not about the money. None of you would be here today right now if it was about the money on a Saturday. I mean, come on, give me a break. But uh, anyway, attorney's fees, very critical component. Unlike most private tort litigants, a civil rights plaintiff seeks to vindicate important civil and constitutional rights that cannot be valued solely in monetary terms. Regardless of the form of relief he or she actually obtains, a successful civil rights plaintiff often secures important social benefits, 
That's the purpose, the underlying congressional purpose and intent supporting 42 U.S.C. Section 1988. Our legislators <coughs> recognize these are important rights. If we don't pay attorneys, make it worthwhile, nobody's going to enforce them. Okay? Um, and fee awards have proven to be an essential remedy if private citizens are to have a meaningful opportunity to vindicate the important congressional policies which these laws contain. It's a constant mantra, we got to get paid, it's important work, and the courts recognize this. The, the trial courts sometimes get stingy on the hourly rates and what they think is reasonable time, but they all universally recognize that we need to be paid for the work we're doing, and it has to be sufficient to, in, to entice not, not just the people that are doing the work, but to entice other new talent to come into the field, right? So if we have decent fee awards, people see that, it gets published, it's in the news, it's in decisions, it's buzzing around. Other attorneys see that, and then they're more motivated, perhaps, to go in and, you know, try their hand at it. And that's the whole underlying purpose of, of 42 U.S.C. Section 80, uh, 1988 is to encourage attorneys to come in and do this important work. So we got to pay them. Yeah. I found that if, if the defense is giving me a hard time on a fee application by how many hours I have, I subpoena their records. I do the same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do the same thing. Hate those guys. 1983, man. 1988 attaches. Okay, so they go hand in hand. Since I've never done that before, do you do it on separate? Like, do you, do you have to keep track on your time records of efforts spent? The, the, the way that we do it, and I encourage everybody to do it, because on your fee application, you have to give the judge sufficient information to allow the judge to conduct a meaningful review of each of your entries that you're trying to get money for. So what we do, we have a computerized system. I used to use Abacus, now it's Amicus. And this is left over from my commercial days when I had clients that were actually paying money uh, <laughs> for work. And they would take a sharp pencil to your bill. They, they want detail, what exactly you did, when you did it, who did it, what it was, the substance of the work, and the, you know, the time increment in real time if they could get me to cooperate. Um, so that's sort of a leftover vestige uh, from when I was doing commercial work, but we still maintain the same practice. So I use Amicus now, does billing in six minute increments, no longer real time. I, I don't have the capacity to do real time. I would if I could, because it's more accurate, lends credibility to your fee claim. But um, you, know, you, you record the date that you did the work, who did the work, and then we, we like to keep it sort of like a diary so that I can go back maybe a year later and I can, I can get a real good summation of what it was we were doing at the time, maybe what we were thinking at the time. I've got work product in there, all kinds of stuff. And that you get to redact that when you, when you file it, because you don't want to give up your playbook to the other side. Um, and the court will, will go with that, so long as there's enough data there so the court can assess what you did and whether it was reasonable in the context of the particular you know, function in the case. I do that internally, and, and the way that we do it is, say you have the county and then some private defendant. What we'll do is I have a flag on the particular billing entry that's, say it's Dr., well, she is a county employee, let's use somebody who's not. Say it's Dr. Wong at Children's Hospital. There will be a flag on the billing entry that says Children's Hospital Wong. So we'll know when we go through to do, do that accounting and put together the numbers for the judge, you know, all these entries are for Wong because we've labeled it and they're attributable to her. Now the cool thing about 1988 is, to the extent that you know, Wong maybe is a defendant, let's say she gets dismissed, she wins, she's out. The county's gonna come back and argue, oh, well all those hours, I mean, we can account for it. There's a thousand hours they spent on Dr. Wong and she's gone, so we don't have to pay for that. If you can show, and you usually can, that the time you spent on her, her conduct was integrally related to the conduct you won on, you still get all the money. So it's, it's not an out for them necessarily to get people dismissed or claims dismissed. If the effort is related to the claims that you succeeded on, you're still going to get paid. Uh, as a prevailing plaintiff's attorney should recover, there's a fully compensatory fee. Well, this is the start of it. That's where it starts, is fully compensatory fee. And the fee award should not be reduced simply because the plaintiff failed to prevail on every contention raised in the lawsuit. <clears throat> The reasonableness of the attorney's fees must be determined 
in light of both the traditional billing practices in the profession and the fundamental principle that the award of a reasonable attorney's fee under Section 1988 means a fee that would have been deemed reasonable if billed to affluent plaintiffs by their own attorneys. That's where you end up seeing these high rates. My current rate approved by the Southern, Southern District of California is $700 an hour. Yeah, yeah. You, you can get, uh, if you devote yourself to this, you do the work, you know, you take the hits you're gonna take, you can get some really decent fee awards. Yeah. How far back can you go? Is it to the, I mean, so for example, we do a lot of dependency work in this, mm -hmm. we talked primarily about it a little bit today. Yeah. Um, is, is it from the time of the wrong flag and all the consequences mm -hmm. of doing the dependency, et cetera? That's damages. A component, and I'll, I'll address it because we didn't address it in the, we didn't really get to damages in the presentation because um, we're really just issue spotting. That's more of a technical issue. Okay, what happens when you get to trial and you have to put together your damages? You're going to have an economic component of damages and a non-economic component of damages. I will frequently, by the time we get in front of a jury, I'll sometimes waive non-economic damages, even if they're substantial, because it kind of minimizes what you're asking the jury to do on a non-economic side. But when we're looking at uh, just computing the damages for the sake of figuring out what we're going to do with the case and you know, whether or not we're going to waive, and that sort of thing, we look at the fees and costs incurred in, the, in defending against the underlying juvenile dependency petition as a measure of damages. That is a compensable injury. I, as the parent, had to pay somebody $50,000 to come in and provide legal services to defend me against this bogus claim, right? That's damages, that's economic. I had to go to all these court-ordered visitations where I had to pay the monitor 100 bucks a visit for you know, 500 of these visits. That's all economic injury because it's bogus, right? That's our claim. I had to go to this psychological counseling, all these classes, all this crap based on this bogus claim, the cost of all that, compensable injury, economic damages. I missed work, or I had my own business, and I lost my business because I had to go to all these classes and do all this other stuff. If you can show, and you'll use an economist to do this, you can show the profitability of your business, hopefully you've had it going for a while, and you have a record, a, a history of running a profitable business, that profit, especially if it's on an upward trajectory at the time of the government interference, that would be great, because then you integrate over the time that you were knocked out, you integrate that curve, that upward trajectory, and the difference between where you're projected to have been and where you ended up, which is probably now at zero, is your economic damage. And if you have your own business, that could end up being a really big number. Uh, but you have to have the data to support it and you're going to need an economist or some kind of financial expert to come in and explain that to the jury and testify, you know, what about what all that means. Because that, it's complex and they're not going to get it. So those are all economic injuries. Your attorney's fees for the litigation begins when you first meet the client and sign them up. So it's going to be from the date you sign that engagement agreement to the date you get your verdict. Well, actually, no to the date you finish all your post-trial motions, your appeal, your initial fee motion, and then whatever intervening stuff happens before you get affirmed on appeal. And then your appellate fees are also gonna be recoverable. Your, your fees... You sign them up on the 1983 claim, right? No, 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 I, okay, you, let, let's say you spend all that money defending the juvenile dependency case, the case is now closed, they have their kids back. Okay. 50 grand in fees there, it's damages. Three weeks later, you sign them up in an engagement agreement. That's when you start your clock ticking for collecting your 1988 fees. File your lawsuit, you do all your discovery, you litigate it, you go to trial, you get your verdict, file a bunch of motions, maybe appeal, whatever it is. You get paid for all of that. You also get paid, neat little twist, for the effort to secure those fees. So Filing your fee motion, you get paid. Responding to their opposition to your fee motion, you get paid, and some of these motions can get astronomical. The last one of these that I got, my fee award for the motion work to secure the fee and defend it was $78,000. Yeah, they fought, you know, every, every step of the way on everything. I mean, everything you could argue, they argued, so you have to address it.
yeah, I'm just sitting there going, okay, yeah, do it, man. Let's, let's, let's go. Whatever you guys want to do, <laughs> you know, let's, let's do it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the fee, and I'm going to get paid, so do whatever you want to do. <laughs> it's, you know, by the time you have a verdict, if your defendant is still throwing up roadblocks and still fighting every step of the way, refusing to become efficient, they deserve to be punished, and that's just one more punishment. Yeah. So if I'm, like on, on a particular case that I won't name, I, I worked for 22 months on the dependency side of it. Uh -huh. In Arkansas, they don't go after the people. They go after the poor and sophisticated mm -hmm. folks. So is there a distinction? Am I going to have a problem collecting that? You, you might, unless in your engagement agreement in the juvenile dependency case, you had some sort of agreement where your client acknowledged that they were going to pay you an hourly rate and that that payment was due and payable as the services were incurred and then you voluntarily continued in, in the case even though they were in arrears and they recognize and acknowledge that as a valid debt. Yeah. <laughs> then it's, then it's going to be, it's damages. They owe the money. It's a, a financial obligation that arose from the bogus claim. And it's an element of damages. 